Today, we know that on a carbon-based economy, we ship over $700 billion worth of, of our economy overseas to fuel the system. Just think if we could take $700 billion every year and park it here in the States. That would have a dramatic effect on the economy. If everyone on Earth consumed as much as the average European, we'd need about three planets worth of resources to support us. If we all live like Americans, we'd need about five planets. Uh, so what we try and do here is create a one-planet lifestyle. One planet is an easy proposition to understand. We have one planet. We're using resources faster than that planet can replenish them. So we don't have any more planets than that. And so we've got to cut back our lifestyle. Frankly, it's just consume less, right? Consume less energy, you know, create less waste. It's a problem of lack of awareness. In the US, buildings consume more energy than transportation or industry. And within the buildings, homes consume more than 50% the building sector energy use. As a result, it is in our national interest to reduce the energy consumption in homes because then we reduce the dependency on foreign oil. Now what we want to do is not be dependent on foreign oil. What we'd want to do is not have to buy any oil. We've got to stop building the way we did. We've got to accept the fact that the economy of construction is only becoming an economic burden to the owner of the home. The way we have been building houses is just an absolute lowest first cost, you know? It's all about lowest first cost. It's not about operating costs. It's not about longevity of building. It's not about durability of building. It's not about any of that. Builders and, and people are going to push back on some of this because there is an increased cost to doing it up front. But again, no one's showing about the long-term benefits of why we need to do this as a country and as a society. And, and that's really where the challenge is, is, is we know it's the right thing to do, but nobody's making the commitment to really do it, except for a few individuals. This is not only a ceremonial groundbreaking, it really is an achievement. The start of a home that will have no electric bills. Today, we're going to pour the foundation of Zero Energy America. This is the day we change our priorities. We make new commitments. We're going to look to the day that fossil fuel is a fuel of the past. The project will build homes that utilize 100% renewable energy, have a net zero energy usage. This will be the first zero energy home and certainly will not be the last. Living in a healthy home certainly makes sense. Living in a home that operates efficiently makes sense. There's nothing green that drives the decision making. It's a smart decision, it's the bottom line. Change comes from two directions. It's either consumer preference or it's legislation. We have no consumer awareness and builders respond to their consumers. It doesn't so much matter who's in the White House or who's controlling Congress. Yeah, these are just smart decisions that can be made oftentimes at the state and the local level. And, you know, that's kind of where we're waging the green war. It's really all very, very local. And so while we'd love to see greater, you know, activity on the national policy side, there's a lot of great stuff happening at the local level that's starting to catalyze this. Zero energy homes works for everyone. It's a zero electric bill. How can you go wrong? That's extra money for groceries, extra money for college, extra money for whatever the case may be. As energy costs have risen around the world, nations have been forced to address their consumption and their energy usage. Governments and consumers in Europe and Asia have sought new and innovative solutions to controlling energy costs by controlling energy consumption in how they build and in how they live. But with relatively cheap energy costs, America has stayed with the status quo and built houses the same way for more than 50 years. Now, as our energy costs rise and we find ourselves engaged in wars in international regions rich in energy resources, we must look for energy solutions literally on the home front. We must look for ways to reduce and eliminate our dependence on foreign energy sources. We must move to a nation where our homes and buildings produce more energy than they consume. We must move to a zero energy America. For builders like Mark Ruttenberg, the challenge is how. 
How do we redefine every aspect of how we build in varying climates to build smart and energy efficient homes that are still affordable and cost effective? Every time we look at it, said, how is it tomorrow's home inside a very familiar, very comfortable platform? For Ruttenberg, a Florida builder, it's a challenge that many have said couldn't be done. What he soon realized, that even with his pedigree from arguably Florida's first family of home builders, the Ruttenbergs, and 25 years of personal building experience, everything he knew about building a home was about to change. We thought we were pretty good. We said, we've got 50 years, third generation, a benchmark in Florida as high as a home builder can push it. Yeah, and we said, throw it out, take everything you know, and start over. Methodology, process, systems, performance. Those words weren't in our vocabulary. Now they control everything. If you look at the history of innovation of building envelopes over the last hundred years, it's disgusting. I mean, it's two by four walls. Those have been around since, what, the late 1800s. In the 60s or 70s, somebody decided, oh, well, let's start to fill that cavity with blown fiberglass. About the same time, people decided double-pane glass was kind of a good thing to do. The innovation in building envelopes is zero. Talk about an easy area to focus some innovation on. When homeowners think about, well, I want to green my home, the first thing they start thinking about is, well, I should put solar panels on my roof. And that's one of those major misconceptions that we try really hard to combat. I have the conversation at least three times a week. People are all jazzed up. Or, I'm going to put solar panels on my roof. And it's like, yeah, they're cool, but is the house leaky? I mean, that's where you got to start. If you think about the history of innovation in the housing sector, nobody would, in their right mind, if they needed a computer, would go buy a 1920s adding machine. Nobody would go buy a Model T unless they're you know, a collector or something. But lots of people go buy a 1920s bungalow, and that's in large part because it's not technologically all that different than what's being built today. What does make sense is the low-lying fruit, air sealing, you know, um, doing weather stripping on windows, uh, replacing windows, replacing doors, these kind of things. You just got to insulate. Better windows, better doors, and insulation in the attic and floor or basement. Controlling air infiltration is the priority over and above the thermal layer itself. So no matter how big the thermos bottle is, if I put holes in it, don't put the top on, it's not going to work real well. We have got to shut down air infiltration, do everything possible to maintain the integrity of the thermal envelope. Isonine spray foam is both an insulation and an air barrier. That combination gives us some unique properties that ordinary conventional insulation does not have. Initially, it was, it was really just used in high-end residential homes, expensive custom-made homes for people who cared a lot about the environment and about their energy bills and wanted to do the right thing. So it was quite limited in the beginning. But lately, spray polyurethane foam insulation has been spreading down into production homes and, and much broader use and into commercial buildings and other areas. Spray foam is a better material than traditional insulations because it's, it's one that's more rigid and durable. It keeps its shape better for the life of the house. Other types of insulation will, will dip and sag and, uh, over time, but the spray foam structure is such that it stays and keeps its shape and, and strength and durability for the life of a building. Some of the other benefits of isonine, in addition to the energy efficiency, are the acoustical properties. It makes a home much quieter. As the home is tightly sealed, very little air from the outside gets in. Really, the only air that comes into the home, other than opening windows and doors, comes in through mechanical ventilation, which is filtered. So what we see when we, when we uh, do a home in isonine is that there's very little dust, very little pollen in the home. So people with allergies are positively affected. When you're looking at the performance of insulation, if the insulation doesn't perform as an air barrier, or there isn't an integral air barrier as part of that system, then the performance of the insulation gets compromised. If you take insulation and you adhere it to a surface, you can adhere it over things that normally used to be a problem in terms of thermal performance. And the complicated structural materials, if you eliminate those thermal bridges, you get much better performance. 
And imagine a house that you can maintain constant temperatures and you can maintain humidity control and you don't have concerns about moisture buildup in the exterior walls or in the roof. Imagine the flexibility, the freedom that that brings, and that's what you're looking at when you provide this kind of a solution. Lots of folks have found with a simple change of insulating their attic in a, a warm air conditioning climate, at the roof line versus on the floor of the attic, they're saving upwards of 50% on their energy bills. Quite significant. The amount of energy that's saved is so substantial that in the life cycle of the product, it likely is the most energy efficient of any of the insulation products that you can use because it has that air barrier attribute. Engineers have begun to think of the building envelope as a system. And so the building envelope would include all the materials from inside the paint on the inside of the home to the siding on the outside of the home and everything in between. If you design the building envelope properly, then you get good moisture performance, keep out mold and mildew, you get energy efficiency, and you get sound deadening so that the interior of the space is very quiet and, and pleasant. Back in 1992 when Andrew went through and this state just got devastated by a Category 5 hurricane, and our goal at that time was to build the best window we could build to protect people, and we developed an impact resistant window. This shot we just did previously and you could see how, yes, there was a nice cracking pattern. There was the outer layer, which was the IG that did break, but the window itself is still in great shape, no penetration. So this is what you expect from an impact window. As time went on and we started looking at the energy costs and, and looking at the movement coming to Florida and saying, okay, there's, there's energy costs here that are getting higher. So now we had to marry that, that impact resistant product to a really energy efficient window. Well, one of the things that people should definitely consider is the, the functionality of the window in terms of the overall energy efficiency of the home and the impact that has on your other systems. You can decrease the size of your AC unit simply by upgrading your windows. And the net effect is a saving not only in the total building cost, but ultimately in your energy bills. With the, the Zero Energy project that we're working on with Mark Ruttenberg Homes, the windows that were actually installed were energy efficient, vinyl wind guard impact windows and what it allowed the construction to, to carry out was that the HVAC system would have required nine tons for the square footage of this home. And because of the windows that were installed and the insulation in the home, they were able to bring it down to three one-ton units, which is a considerable savings to the consumer in the long run. But in a home that has truly old windows, windows that are single pane, maybe they're 20 years old, the savings is considerable. And, and on your heating or AC cost, it could be as much as 25%. By putting energy efficient windows in, you can downsize your HVAC, you can save energy costs, and over the course of two years to five years, you're gonna actually have a net energy saving on your house. The Zero Energy Project is going to allow us to really demonstrate to the consumer that you can build a zero energy home in Florida by protecting the building envelope and this is what we really need to do to educate people to move forward in this movement. You know, we think someday windows will actually capture energy and put it back into the house. If you're looking at that 10% cost or 20% cost to build an energy efficient house and make that envelope the best envelope you can possibly make, you're going to save that money for the life of the house. But your life of a house is going to be, you know, 50 to 75, 100 years. So you've got that energy efficiency that whole time going forward for a really small cost on the front end. The envelope is the easiest thing to understand in terms of making some sort of efficiency gains, I think, because you can just think of it in terms of a draft. That can come from cracks around a window, cracks in the foundation. A lot of people have homes, you, you go and see where the pipes go in and out of the house and you, you're stunned. You know, it's like you can actually see around there. So it's critical to have a tight envelope. The evolution of the envelope as a primary principle in energy efficient design has its foundation in Passivhaus design principles. Originally developed in 1988 by Professor Bo Adamson of Sweden and Professor Wolfgang Feist of Germany, Passivhaus, or Passive House in America, is a rigorous voluntary standard for energy efficiency in a building centered around reducing the ecological footprint that results in ultra-low energy buildings that require little energy for space heating or cooling. 
Since its inception, there are now more than 50,000 structures worldwide that utilize these design principles that include positioning of the structure, material choices, systems choices, and windows and doors, all selected for how they contribute to the management of the thermal barrier. A passive house is a building that is, it doesn't have to be a house, it could be a commercial building, it could be a skyscraper, it could be a school, that is built to a very demanding energy performance standard. You have ventilation requirements, you have fresh air, air quality requirements, you have heating and cooling requirements, and you've got to make them all work together. And it's possible to do that. I build a passive house to save money and to live comfortably. The walls were insulated panels that were anchored with interior walls, regular two by four walls. The walls have windows that are very efficient. They retain heat and in the winter time, the wall, the glass surface, the floor surface, they're all equal temperature. And I've measured, I, I know that for a fact. Energy recovery ventilation is a key part of the passive house design approach and it's partly because the envelope is super tight which means, you know, conventionally designers build houses knowing that they leak and that's how they make sure that you get enough fresh air in the house, which is not a great way to go about it, but it's been possible because energy's been cheap. Now you say, well, we're gonna seal this thing, but when we seal this thing, what happens? Well, now we don't get enough fresh air unless we actively make sure we do. So you set up this very highly efficient energy recovery ventilation system where you have a really highly efficient motor, runs very quiet, and it runs at a very low level continuously. With an ERV, if it's cold outside and warm inside, then the air is exchanged across the ERV and mixed in a chamber with an enthalpy wheel or an enthalpy exchange, raising the temperature of cold outside air to or close to the temperature of the inside air. If it's warm outside and cold inside, like summer months, the process is reversed. In some instances, an inline microheater or microcooler about the size of a hairdryer will be installed to further raise or lower the temperature of the air before it enters the building environment. But long before the builder worries about an ERV, they have to make many construction material choices that can affect the efficiency of the structure and its envelope. Today, there are a variety of products in this emerging marketplace that offer better performance for builders focused on increasing the effectiveness of the thermal envelope and reducing the ecological footprint of the home. When building his first zero energy home, Mark Rettenberg took the time to research and select the materials with that goal in mind. What we're looking at is AAC, autoclaved aerated concrete, extraordinarily structural performance, thermal performance, fire resistance. It's as safe, as reliable, as any exterior building envelope product that we've ever worked with. AAC is autoclaved aerated concrete. Basically, it's a lightweight concrete. And the lightweight and how it's aerated is where it gets some of its thermal properties. I believe this product has something to offer our society as a whole and the sustainability movement as a whole as well because you can reduce dramatically the amount of energy you use when you construct buildings with this product. Energy usage ends up creating a lot of the CO2 issue that we have here in this country. And quite frankly, when you add up energy used in homes and commercial buildings, it dwarfs what happens, for example, in transportation. So it's very important to use a product like this and others to reduce it in buildings. Builders have an opportunity to offer the consumer something that can bring value, again, to save energy long term. But the builders have to be willing to proactively tell their buyers, I have this package for you. To say, here's what you're really trying to accomplish. And don't allow other people to value engineer out some of the really good things that can be put in sustainability-wise, particularly if they end up saving money in the life cycle cost of a building. The group here decided to test various types of construction. AAC was one of those, and another one was concrete block, and another one was normal kind of wood framing, if you will. We are asked to come out while Hable demonstrated the fire properties of each building. Well, after the fire first began, each one had the same fire load, 36 pallets in each one of the typical buildings. Within 
14 minutes, the first wood building started to fail. A few minutes afterwards, around 15 minutes, the concrete building started to show signs of failure. It was just amazing. It was, the comparison was clear compared to the regular concrete block construction and the wood construction. A fire was going inside the building. You could put your hand on the outside of the building and you couldn't feel the heat. And it's because it's so well insulated. You know, eventually it will char and whatever, but you're not going to feel that heat for a long time because it takes a long time to pass through. Hands down, it just proved how good their product is. What we learn about sustainability, and sustainability in my mind starts and ends with using energy. We have to be willing to make some trade-offs. We believe that you will may spend a little bit more somewhere, but you'll end up saving more because you save more energy later on. As important as the material choices are, how those products are manufactured is just as important. One company, Boro Bricks, is leading by example by redefining how a brick manufacturing plant is conceived, designed, built, and operated. When you're looking at the effectiveness of materials, your decisions are impacting you far beyond the home you're building. You're impacting the community, you're impacting the regional economies. If you start looking at the effectiveness of your materials, then start looking at the way they're made. Who's making them and where they're coming from? Burl Bricks is a great example. Cradle to cradle manufacturing facility located where natural materials are available, located where they can take advantage of old existing methane gas, being able to run their plant on recyclable materials. The Terre Haute facility is unique in that all level of sustainability from the energy sources to how we win the clay are all factored into uh, to, to really doing a good job of making a sustainable product. We located this facility adjacent to a, a methane source provided by an existing landfill. We knew that we wanted to get involved in a plant that had a landfill that was mature enough that we could siphon off the gas for a, a long foreseeable window so that we could go ahead and put in the equipment and design the plant to utilize the methane gas. The methane production in a, in a landfill is forever. I mean, it, it's not going to stop. Once the process starts, you've got to do something with that methane. Either it escapes the atmosphere or it has to be collected and flared off. Methane is some 20 times more damaging to the environment than, than carbon dioxide is. To take that energy and, and make a, a product out of it in a beneficial use is certainly a plus for everybody. The Terre Haute plant is actually a really, it, it's just a perfect location for a brick manufacturing plant from our standpoint. Now being located near a, a mine site where there's a large amount of overburden, which is basically the, the soil and the mineral materials that are removed as they dig down to get to the coal that they want. All of this stuff they have to dig through comes up to the surface. They have no use for that. So there it sits. We have a use for that, and they want to get rid of it. And again, it's a win-win situation. We've looked at different types of technologies where we can really utilize a waste material or something that would otherwise be toxic or landfill material or a gas that you don't want and bring it in and use it as a fuel material. Well, I think obviously the consumer is going to want to buy a product which is made responsibly out of materials that otherwise might be wasted. In the case of, the, of this facility, it's the energy from the, the landfill gas, as well as the fact that we're not digging up a fresh place in the earth. We're taking old mine spoils and making a usable product out of it. Smart construction, whether it's the Burl Brick plant or this house, the economics of building materials and building methodology is smart construction. And what you're going to find over and over is the adoption of high performance systems, high performance materials. You're adopting it because of the expected life cycle performance of the products. Using sustainable materials that are manufactured responsibly is only one part of the equation. To achieve a zero energy or net zero standard where the building creates more energy than it consumes, we have to rethink every aspect of how to build. Project Frog, a San Francisco startup, is doing just that and dragging a 19th century industry into the future with stylish, energy efficient buildings that can be built in less time and as much as 50% cheaper. 
Project Frog uses natural light, ventilation, and site-specific design to create highly efficient buildings that range from convenience stores to schools to specialty projects like Chrissy Field Center at San Francisco's historic Golden Gate Park. The mission behind the company is to create buildings that are better, greener, faster, and cheaper kind of all at the same time. One of the goals that we've set out to do is to make sure that every building that we put in place is capable of being energy neutral. The intent is to drive down the energy demand by just increasing energy efficiency. The center brings 28,000 kids from various parts of San Francisco to uh, teach them various environmental principles. They have great programs. Part of the center's mission is it's, it's an environmental center, so obviously what we wanted to do was reflect that in the construction of this new building. In 2009, the existing center had to move and it was sort of on an emergency basis. So we were tasked at the Conservancy to find a solution that we could implement within a year. We looked at a variety of different solutions. It needed to be something that was designed safe for school children. We settled on Project Frog and I think it's been a good collaboration. What we want to do is to optimize based on the use, based on the location, what the best strategies are for a given location. And really what you want to think about is not just the green components but the correlative health components. The goal, right, is to just kind of reduce waste across the board. So when we're manufacturing, when, uh, when we're on site, and when we're actually operating the building. Some of the interesting features of the building that you can see right from the outside. The building is clad in old growth redwood that we salvaged uh, from a railroad tunnel. The red siding over there is a, a product called EcoClad. If you go out back, you'll see um, sort of a large water tank. It collects the rain off of the roof, supplies over 50% of the water. Why waste good purified domestic water when you can use rainwater for that? The building's well insulated enough with the cool roof that reflects uh, radiant heat off of it that we don't need to cool the building at all. Simply opening the windows is adequate. What we did in this building is we used what's called an underfloor displacement ventilation system, which is a complicated way of saying the air actually comes up from the floor. So instead of air being pushed down on you like a standard heating and cooling system, it rises. And because of the, the nature of air and convection, the air tends to collect around you. We use what we call daylight autonomy, which means that uh, you just don't need lights on in the building during some of the hours. In a school, for example, that can save you as much as 40% of your energy spent, like that, just by putting in a better glass. We got installed a um, 24kW photovoltaic system that uses a pretty interesting microinverter technology, so we can monitor the panel efficiency, uh, panel by panel, in real time. The whole process to get from foundation to cold shell is usually about 20 days which is 5x faster than most buildings. It really is about being responsible and producing what we consume. I think it's like 72% of our municipal landfills are construction debris. And that's just not sustainable. And so as we think about you know, just the, the full impact, the full life cycle assessment of buildings, you know, the energy that we consume in those buildings over 50 years, 100 years, whatever it is, there's no choice but to rethink you know, the way that we strategize around our communities. Designing an entire community around a green, sustainable, energy-efficient lifestyle is a monumental task. It may sound far-fetched, but these communities already exist all around the world and are being developed right here in America. One London-based company, Bioregional, is driving development worldwide with the sustainable message of a one-planet lifestyle. Only consume what the planet can support. At Bar Regional, what we're really trying to do is create places where it's easy for people to have a whole green lifestyle. So that includes things like green buildings, so energy efficient buildings, supply of renewable energy, but also looks at transport solutions, for example, reducing dependence on the car by introducing car clubs, looking at how we can make it easy for people to recycle and how they can get more local organic food. So the One Planet Communities Program is basically creating a small handful of places around the world that go further than anyone else has gone in terms of sustainability, creating places where we get a reduction in the footprint of the people who live there. This is a way to look at sustainability that's not just about a building, it's not just about a street, it's not just about a piece of infrastructure, but it's really about the people who live in those buildings and their behaviors as well. It folds all that together. So BEDZ was really our first attempt at creating a place where people could lead a whole sustainable lifestyle. And it was really analyzing BEDZ that we came up with the One Planet Living concept. 
through the analysis of looking at where people's environmental savings were coming from, what really brought benefit, what perhaps we thought brought benefit but didn't, but also what improved people's quality of life. BedZed was a, a project that was finished in 2002, and it was an initiative to create 96 homes in a sustainable um, passive solar village and then have commercial space so that there would be jobs on site as well. Where we're standing right now, we're at the BedZed Eco Village. That stands for the Beddington Zero Energy Development in South London. We've been here for about 10 years now, so we're, we're quite settled in. And we're trying to find mainstream ways to live sustainably and at the same time have a really good quality of life. When we started to think about BedZed, we really wanted this to be a place where if people made a personal effort, they really could live sustainably here. We did think very long and hard about the materials that we used here. Our aim was to choose local, environmentally accredited, reclaimed, recycled materials. Currently, about 20% of our electricity comes from the PV panels. The rest of our electricity is coming from the grid and our hot water is coming from three efficient on-site gas condensing boilers. Our long-term plan is to get a biomass boiler using local waste wood to give us our heat um, and to go on a green tariff for the rest of our electricity. But even without that, you know, 100% renewable energy supply at the moment, we're still reducing our carbon emissions from the buildings by about 60%. That's really good. I mean, that's down to really energy efficient appliances, the design of the buildings and the way that people are living in those buildings. So, I mean, that's already a, a big efficiency. We were looking at reducing our water use by about 50%, reducing our electricity by 25%, our heating by 88% and reducing our private car miles by about 50%. We have met or exceeded all of those targets, so we're really happy with that. But if we look at the complete ecological footprint impact, we're actually not getting down to that one planet level, which we were surprised about. So we went back and we were checking all of our figures, doing more studies to see, you know, well, what, what is happening here? And the thing is, BedZed is quite small. There are 100 homes here, you know, there are some offices here, we have a community centre, but when people need to go to use the schools, use the hospitals, use the shops, go to work, they're back out in the unsustainable world, so their impact is going to go up. This costs roughly about 50% more per square metre to build than a conventional development at the time. But really it was a, a test case. The idea was to learn from this and then take what worked and leave what didn't work and bring those into the next generation designs. So One Brighton, the next community that um, we've been involved in with the developer Bioregional Quintain, that is a profitable development, you know, so many years down the line. One Brighton is a project uh, built on the findings of Bedset. One Brighton is a project uh, right next to the train station in downtown Brighton, which is a seaside resort town. It's 172 units. It's a building in the United Kingdom that's gone further I think in terms of energy efficiency than almost any of the others. One Brighton is an example where we're creating a zero energy building and we do that by generating about half the renewable energy on site so we have some photovoltaic panels, not a huge amount, but we generate the heat from a wood heating system. But then we've also set up an energy services company which bulk buys guaranteed green electricity from a wind farm uh, and we distribute that to our residents. These are the two buildings of one Brighton. You have Brighton Bell and Pullman Hall in the distance. It's very much a commercial venture, but from the outset, um, certain principles were put in place through the design, the construction and now the living phase. And those principles are supposed to make the building as sustainable as possible. I can monitor what's going on with the biomass boiler. I can check pressures temperatures. The biomass boiler we have on site here, it's a 500 kilowatt binder model. It runs on wood chip. That wood chip comes from local Sussex forests, so that's coppice material as well, so those trees will grow back. It's as close to zero carbon as we're going to get. The heat that's generated from that is used to heat 20,000 litres of water, which is pumped as a district heating system around the entire building. That's 172 apartments, about 10 commercial units. So we've got general waste, we've got glass, and we've got mixed recyclables. But we've also got a, a food waste chute. 
Um, underground here, we have a mechanical composter. So what happens is residents are issued with these biodegradable bags they can get from me. They fill it with whatever organic material uh, they have. That can be leaves, bread, bones, meat, whatever. We drop it down the food waste chute. Um, from there, it's put into the composter. In about eight weeks, we'll get compost out there. We can use that compost that's generated in the rooftop allotments. What's unusual about One Brighton is getting all these different simple technologies in the one place. I think One Brighton has proved that you can build a project like this, make it successful. Every single apartment here has been sold, and that's bucking a trend in the UK. One Brighton, I think, stands out because it was a building that was delivered without any additional cost. So it was built within the conventional build cost envelope, but it's a zero carbon building. And this project had the best sales performance in the southeast of England. So it was very financially successful as one of the greenest buildings in the world. I think um, green living, it's very important into the future. And if people actually see the benefits in their lives, um, in their children's lives, and see that actually you don't need a major lifestyle change to actually live greener, um, I think people will jump on board. Through detailed analysis, we really understood that creating a whole sustainable lifestyle was important. That's everything, not just green buildings, but also food, managing waste and recycling more, and looking at transport. Sonoma Mountain Village is a fantastic project in California, just north of San Francisco. And Sonoma Mountain Village is a redevelopment of about three quarters of a million square feet of existing buildings. The project really was a vision of Brad Baker, who's CEO of Codding Enterprises. The vision was born on the fact that development can't keep being done the same way. If we're going to be stewards of the earth, and we're going to be responsible to the environment. So HP Agilent had a factory there, and they abandoned it. They left behind 3,000 parking spaces in these big box buildings that nobody wanted to do anything with. And this real estate developer that had been developing strip malls came along with a new vision, bought the property, and have created a new urbanist plan for the project that, that means that those existing buildings stay. They get retrofitted and they turn into job centers. And around the edge of those buildings, condominiums are put in place at the exterior as well as retail, cafes, a new cinema, grocery store. And then all around those existing buildings, 1,900 homes are added. And so what you get at the end is a project where there's gonna be 4,500 residents and 4,500 jobs. A place where you're gonna be a five minute walk from everything you need a place where 100% of the power is going to be generated on-site using renewable power. And that's just the start. We have opportunity to expand that. The houses will be totally self-sufficient as well. There's a 15-year build-out to this project, and it'll change as we go through, and we'll take advantage of new technology. So this is, to my mind, this is the start of something that's going to be absolutely fantastic. Our community, you'll be able to, to, to live here, you'll be able to work, here, you'll be able to dine and shop here and play here. And you'll be able to do it all within this, this beautiful, sustainable community. You could have a green building, but to make a green lifestyle, you need more than a green building. You need a, a green community. And so we wanted something that had that scale, something that, that had places for people to work, places for people to shop, places for people to recreate, and then obviously places for people to live. And we thought by, by having the scale, we could have a much more comprehensive approach and, and create a much more holistic, sustainable lifestyle. So the first thing we did is we got energy efficient. We started turning things off that, that didn't need to be on, finding more efficient pumps and putting timers on things and, and really you know, just reducing the waste that was involved. We put our first solar array in, in in 2006, and it was very impactful on our utility bill. Time went on and we decided to add another array. And the other thing that happened is we got a lot more people out here. We went from being an abandoned campus to home to about 800 employees that come here every day. In here, we also have what we call a business incubator. And it's a place where small businesses, instead of starting in their garage, they can come and plug and play and start their business in this incubation. And then they're grown, and then they take root as a fully-fledged business in Roanoke Park or in Sonoma Mountain Village. 
we've completely taken the typical model and thrown it out. We started with jobs. We have around 800 people working here on site right now. So normally in a community like this, you would actually start with the homes, the people, then the jobs come along afterwards. Well, we've started with the jobs. Well, we've been going through the rezoning of the site and the entitlements for this site. We actually started leasing the space out here, which of course went along with the jobs. And for a landowner, that makes it a model that is self-sustaining. So while we're going through this, instead of sitting waiting on the economy for our return on our investment, we're already receiving a return on our investment. We went across the country. We actually went overseas. We tried to find other projects. We found bits and pieces of what we wanted our community to be like, but we did not find a true model. We were able to find new urban projects and we were able to find sustainable projects, but we never found one that we felt had the, the look and the feel and the deep sustainability that we wanted. So a lot of what we're doing, we basically are kind of the, uh, the pioneers on. When you look at the whole picture, it's not just a zero carbon development, it's not just a zero waste development, but it's a place where we're reinventing the American business park and building houses around it, not separating them so that the factories and the jobs are here and the houses are over here, but mixing them up and saying, you know what, it's really okay for people to live next to their jobs. In fact, it's gonna be better. It's gonna be richer to be able to go visit your kid at lunch break at the daycare nearby. And I think that this is a template for not just new communities in the United States, but for the retrofit of the American suburbs and uh, you know business parks. We knew going in it would be a long-term uh, situation. We, we didn't know it would be quite as long term as, as it's turned out to be. Yeah, you know, that's just the way it goes sometimes. Luckily, everybody's hung in there and, you know, we're still really excited about the future. And have all the lifestyle, luxury, lovely house, impress your friends, and you can help save the world. Do you want to do that or not? I mean, nobody's going to say no. Even as these visionaries develop solutions of long-term sustainable communities, they face challenges from laws and development codes implemented without considering these types of solutions. For instance, at Sonoma Mountain Village, in order to pass power from the community solar arrays to an individual residence, California law will have to be rewritten, allowing direct transfer of power from a non-utility company. Without the support of federal, state, and local government, many of these sustainable communities will never get off the ground. Environmental policy is not kind of front and center in the agenda of most Americans today. We can sort of see a future where it definitely will be, where they understand the financial impacts and the health impacts of making better decisions. And at some point, we're just going to really start to worry about what kind of world we're leaving to our kids and our grandkids. It takes leadership, but the reason I think we all got into this position is not any evildoers. It's just that gas and oil was so cheap. It was so easy to use, we built a whole infrastructure on it. Now it's turning out to be expensive and geopolitically dangerous. So we want to stop doing that. I do think that for the most part you've got governments out there that are trying to figure out a way to support renewable energy, sustainable strategies even in places where, you know, outside of California, where they may not have the same kind of mandates, they're realizing, look, there are jobs on the line. There's jobs that are available if we think differently. New Jersey's a great example where I think a lot of that stuff has taken place. Uh, very accommodative to the solar industry, second largest number of solar installations in the country behind California. And it just gives you a good sense of how really smart policy can help drive that kind of change. This is the first of its kind. This is the first commercial net zero electric building in the United States. 31 Tannery is a great example of being net zero today versus 10 years down the road. We found out it's doable. It's very possible with a little bit of investment. We get paid for the amount of electricity we generate from our system. In New Jersey, we get paid through solar renewable energy credits. We don't need the utility grid to supply us with that electricity. That winds up to be about $30,000 a year in utility savings. Plus, the revenue we get from SREX is about $160,000 a year. So between savings and revenue from our PV system, we earn about $190,000 a year. The PV system was about a $1.4 million investment by the building owner. And we're looking at about six years it's going to take to pay off the system. Builders and, and people are going to push back on some of this because there is an increased cost to doing it upfront. 
but again, no one's showing about the long-term benefits of why we need to do this as a country and as a society, and, and that's really where the challenge is. We know it's the right thing to do, but nobody's making the commitment to really do it. It's really gonna require the government to push people towards this movement. The challenge is that you will get the builders arguing that as you add features to a house, you reduce affordability. And then you get a certain push from government saying, well, homes need to be affordable to a certain percentage of people. And so inherently, then the builders come back and say, well, then you can't make us add this to the house because it won't become affordable. Now, I don't agree with that argument. We did a great example the other day, and it was a $200,000 house versus an Energy Star $210,000 house. And because of the energy savings and water savings and reduced mortgage rate and reduced insurance rates, you actually would be positive $60 a month. And so, but again, if you just look at that dollar per square foot, one's $100 per square foot and one's 105 per square foot. Even though this one saves me $60 a month, most salespeople aren't going to have that conversation with you. They're trying to sell you a house. We have monthly bills, it's a mortgage, it's principal, it's interest, it's energy, it's water, it's a gas bill possibly. It's homeowner's insurance, it's all of those things. And we're only talking mortgage, capital cost. When you factor those other things in, it's definitely more affordable to look at performance. The standards of our construction start with the performance of the home. And that concept wasn't relevant. The building industry largely collapsed. It was on its back. And the decision that we made without realizing at that point when we took on this project was really as simple as we need to be relevant. I know from the feedback of the community that this home immediately is now positioned itself as a competitive benchmark. And people visiting and looking at alternative products available in the market, they're comparing a list of factors that were never on the list. We are installing in the Zero Energy America home for Ruttenberg Home in our VRF product line. And basically that's a variable refrigerant flow system. A variable refrigerant flow technology, in a nutshell, we're moving refrigerant to the zone that needs it. A conventional system comes on, shuts off. Here, I'm running all variable speed indoor units and variable speed outdoor products and moving the refrigerant to the zone that needs it. When we look in this room, for example, we look at ducting supplies that are here and over there. They are the same as we'd use in conventional technology installations. The difference is these duct runs would be 12 inches. They'd be tied back into ducts that are over 20 inches, and they would run more than 70 feet back to a common air handler location. Here, these two ducts are approximately 8 inches. This one runs approximately 12 feet. This one runs approximately 18 feet to an air handler that's here, located in the conditioned attic. I can take a single outdoor unit, in this particular instance, and put five indoor units and give this home five separate cooling zones or heating zones. So what I'm able to do is the zones that don't need it, I'm able to ramp those indoor units down to very low fan speeds, thereby consuming a lot less electricity and only using electricity to provide the, uh, the cooling that's, that's calling for in a particular zone. Conventionally, we locate our systems in the garage and then we transfer that 160 feet across the house. And in that distance, we lose a tremendous amount of the efficiency, not to mention the fact of the air escaping. The separate heating and cooling zones are designated by individual indoor units, and those indoor units are designed to serve the space that they're in. So we're using less materials from an overall installation perspective, but we're also giving each of those zones a controller for temperature and humidity so that we can control each individually. So that maybe you don't need the bedrooms at the same temperature as you need the living space because no one's over there. So now with this system, we have the ability to do that where with a conventional system, it's on or it's off in one set point. In history of LG Group, LG has been uh, greatly successful in home appliances. In the future, LG thinks about environment for the human being and how to 
save energies and how to deliver more benefits to the customers from the environmental and energy saving the prospect. The technologies that we are using at the moment uh, we call is a, a VLF technology, a variable refrigerant flow technology. If we compare it with the conventional system, when you're talking about conventional system, you're referring to the chilled water system or the fan coil units we use. The most popular thing that is applicable in your market may be the ducting system. So instead of uh, going to one-to-one -one system, if you have a multi-split system, you can considerably reduce the installation cost, the first thing, and the second part is the operation cost that is coming up with this system. So when you compare both these costs, this is more cost saving. Our vision is to be a solution provider for total HVAC solution and to become a real energy solution company in the future. We believe this uh, net zero house project in Florida is a perfect fit for our evolutions. And uh, we view this as a you know, good example and platform to demonstrate our energy efficient equipment and we believe this can be a great uh, educational platform since we can you know, demonstrate how it works and our energy efficiencies can be operated as well. What you're looking at here, this is the star of the HVAC show. This is VRF technology. What is so different about the capacity of this equipment, we're able to ramp down to 13% of the production capability and we're able to ramp up to 130%. So contrary to conventional air conditioning standards where the switch is either on or off, I'm at zero or I'm at 100. In order to gain extreme efficiencies in HVAC design, as the load on the house changes and the demand for heating or cooling changes throughout the house, we have to have a condensing system that can adjust itself so it's only producing really what the house is calling for. If I was installing a conventional straight cooler heat pump operated system, the typical Florida new construction environment for the VRF system, it's going to cost more money. But as soon as you say to me, but I want to add zoning to a conventional system, I want to upgrade the SEER. SEER relates to the efficiency, higher the efficiency, lower operating cost. As soon as you say to me, I need a variable speed fan, as soon as you say, I really should go to a variable speed compressor, it's going to cost more money. So I keep increasing the cost of the conventional system. Once I do that to try to mimic the effectiveness of the VRF system, I've never reached the true effectiveness of the VRF. I didn't come close to reducing my operating costs to the cost reduction available through the VRF operations. I didn't match up to the flexibility of the VRF products and I spent the same amount of money. And in 10 years, it's designed to fail. Real case and real life studies is we're seeing as much as 40, 50, 60% energy savings on an electric bill for these systems. Any of these homes that we're building nowadays that are tight and you know we're trying to run conventional systems and run a snake ductwork, large ductwork through attic spaces and, and restrict air flows. And here I'm running quarter inch and half inch copper line sets through these chases and truss spaces and then putting these little air handlers where they go. And by doing so, we just greatly improve the comfort levels of the homes that we're working with. We've been investing in VRF technology for long. And we've been heavily pursuing this technology to be a, the platform to win. And as a result, we are seeing the growth rapidly. And regions like Europe, regions like Japan, already embraces heat pump technology as a source of renewable technology. And the penetration of this technology accelerated in Europe already up to 40%. You know, countries like UK, France, and then Italy. And also in Asia, China, Korea, already more than 60%, including Japan. So when energy cost is becoming more important factor for builders and contractors, they are accepting these technologies.
By employing passive house design principles for the thermal envelope and achieving a tightly built home with very little air infiltration and heat transfer, Mark Rettenberg set up a system where VRF air conditioning technology could reduce the energy consumption required to heat and cool the home. This overall system design to reduce energy requirements then allows the builder to look at solar solutions for the home. Because of energy consumption reductions, solar becomes a viable, cost-effective solution, especially in Florida. In the second half of Zero Energy America, we'll explore solar as a viable option to not only reducing our carbon footprint, but reducing homeowners' monthly expenses. We'll go to Germany, a world leader in renewable energy, and discover how a simple incentive program being emulated now in Gainesville, Florida, has halted the construction of new nuclear and coal power plants and made the country capable of producing more renewable energy than it consumes. And we'll explore new technology and products that make energy efficient, sustainable construction a cost-effective reality today. Plus, we'll look at real answers to not only what the government can do, but what you can do to retrofit your current home right now to help move us to a zero energy America. Maybe not everyone's like this, but when I go out there and watch my electromechanical electric power meter run backwards, it just fills me with joy. To me, the solutions are there. Now it's an issue of let's do it. You could build a home that is a zero energy home today, and it doesn't have to break the bank if you do it right. If you're going to progress, if you're going to move forward, why, why not? stop having to use oil? Why not stop having to use coal? Why not use things that are clean, things that make sense, things that happen to be free?